And it's still the breakfast and plus TV Africa. Now we're uh, coasting this conversation, you know, uh, to the other side of the divide. Hopefully we join the newsroom at nine o'clock for the news brief. We'll be joined by a guest this morning to talk about the issue of gender inequality. Well, the argument for or against gender inequality is a conversation that has remained in the corridor of global debate. And so it's not limited, you know, to Nigeria. However, studies have revealed that gender inequality negatively impacts the economy as inequality is a problematic issue. It lowers the well-being and as is regard that as a form of injustice in every conception of equity or equality. Now, there's been a lot of advocacy by both government and civil society making a case for gender equality and providing equal opportunities over the years. Recently, Government at all levels have been urged to work vigorously towards achieving gender equality in all sectors of the country. We talk about Nigeria now. The president and founder of Women in Mining in Nigeria, engineer Janet Adeyemi, has said that gender inequality, particularly violence against women and children, remains a source of concern in Nigeria. Now, the question is what factors are contributing to gender inequality? Now, joining us to make a sense of this conversation is Honorable Engineer Janet Adeyemi, uh, who is the president and founder of Women in Mining in Nigeria, uh, right in Lagos. Uh, it's good to have you join us, Janet Adeyemi. Right in me, and I'm excited that this is a front burner debate. All right, then. So when, whenever we talk about, you know, gender inequality, what exactly are we talking about? Gender inequality simply means that two, two different sexes, men and women, or boys and girls, and girls don't have equal access to opportunities. The opportunities can be in terms of economic opportunities, material opportunities, any form of opportunities, or even behavioral opportunities. Where one, uh, one does a thing, you condemn it, and the other one does the same thing, and he escapes. So... Inequality is just about that. So when people are equal, you understand, you treat them equally because they are both human beings. But over time, I mean, there's been uh, a lot of emphasis on women whenever we talk about gender inequality. Why is that the case? Uh, several factors are responsible for it, and topmost of it is culture and tradition. You, you and I, we agree that even, even till now, when a girl gives, when a woman gives birth to a, a male child, the excitement is there in the air. Uh, these days when you do gender revel uh, revelation, you know, your, that is the Gen Z age, when you do gender revelation, you can see excitement all over the place when the thing pops out blue. Oh, they say, well, I have a male child. I say the female child is, in, 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 is inferior. So that is a, one of the major factors. Workplace culture, leadership, no, you don't have role models, lack of education. You know, these are, these are major things that have played parts over time, you know, that has caused this suppression, stereotyping, to make you believe that girl child is not so important, it's not significant, you understand? And because, and so that has created a lot of things that have excluded them from political uh, 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 political discourse, economic power, and things like that. But, but so my question, my, my question is, why is is it that the emphasis is always on, yeah, I mean, if you gender equality, whenever we say gender equality, it's not uh, restricted to a certain gender, that's the female gender, but uh, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking why the emphasis over time has always been on the female gender. It looks like the man has been excluded from it. So when we talk about gender inequality, it looks like it's only the women that are always excluded or no. you know, the victims. They, you see, it's a, it's, a mis, it's a misconception. Why it seems as if it's the women that are in the front, if I understand your question, is that right now, if you look at the balance, it's tilted, you understand, towards the women. You understand, the women are quite marginalized. They are not on the scene. And whereas when you look at the population of Nigeria, as we speak today, I try to go even through the statistics. You find out that men are more than women. But when it comes to the issue of sharing resources or anything, you find out that the women, you know, have the lowest number. Go to Global Index, you look at, you look at the numbers, the numbers are embarrassing, Nigerians are sliding down. So 
you find that when you talk of inequality, in whichever way you want to look at it, it affects the women more. When you talk about equality, you know, normally inequality or equality, both boys and men and men and women, boys and girls, you know, must be treated. But right now, as of this age, as of this time, women are more marginalized than men. Over time, because like I keep on saying, give it another 20, 30 years, you will be amazed because most men are now dropping out of school. You know, they are hustling and they are, they are being distracted by lots of things, drugs and co. You find out that more women might even be in positions where we start talking of boy child. You know, where we, in fact, Lagos State has started addressing the issue of boy child. Uh, wh wh why, why do we have, I mean, this, uh, this situation persisting? Because we hear that... It, it, it might get worse. You know, there was a gender bill uh, that was introduced uh, at the National Assembly some time ago. It failed to uh, see the light of day. It failed to be passed. There were protests all over the place and there was some sort of compromise. On the ground, we are not seeing an, um, a significant improvement, some will say, in, in, you know, gender, uh, in bridging the gender gap. Um, but some will argue that that is not the case. Um, that uh, women have the same rights in Nigeria as men do. So where do you stand on this? And then if you uh, I disagree with those who say women have the same rights and opportunities and that is, uh, it's getting better, why is it not getting better? It's not getting better because you see some things are deep-rooted and culture and norms are the most difficult things to change. If you look at it as we speak, I'll give you a typical example. Let me go back to women in mining, for instance. Some women went to site and they had accidents because they were being abused by the men. You understand? And that is the form of transportation they use. When you allow women to sit on trucks of loaded uh, on a truck loaded with sacks of uh, uh, mineral mineral minerals, and unfortunately, when they got to one of the bad spots, the thing just threw them up and come and see them flying out of their vehicle with the babies, and they died. Till today, we try to trace the truck owner, the police and everything. They, they were frustrated. And the few women who survived, they are so scared of, of saying anything because they were at the lower route of the ladder. Their husbands probably told them, shut up, you can't do this. Women, as you, so you find out that socially they are excluded, materially they are excluded. So where they can even engage in conversations are minimal. That does not mean that a few are able to shoot up and what is the number? So you are comparing figures now. So women, it's, in Nigeria, you have the girls in wireless, you have the OB, you have so many of them like that. But what percentage are they? You can count them on your fingertips. And what has limited these things are education, you understand, culture, stereotyping, even behavioral assessments, where when a man does his thing, look at corruption and let's be corruption. I remember it became a joke in Nigeria. They would say, ah, women, they steal. How many women are in our government that are stealing compared to the men that are stealing? You understand corruption? I'm not approving corruption, but that's the level of stereotyping how women we are being condemned. So for me, these factors still hold women down. You understand? They are still not the number they should be. Okay. But I also like you to establish, you know, the connection with, uh, I know you have mentioned it in the passing, in the course of responding to the previous question, but what exactly uh, and examples, you know, with the uh, connection with inequality, gender inequality and violence against children and women? Is there a connection? There's a major, there's a major connection because, in fact, when you look at it, just on face value, look at countries where they virtually have women and men, you know, of that is there's equity. Such countries are peaceful. Uh, because there's no reason for anything. Everybody knows their rights. They can assert their rights. So there's no, there's no, the, the Leviathan law have a way of always, principles have a way of always springing up. One wanting to oppress the other. Because the moment you know you have a superior power or you have access to some things and the other one does, you, you know, the, the very nature of man, you understand, is to tend to oppress. But when you know you're of equal standing or if, of equal footing, you have access to the same legal procedures, you have access to everything. In terms of workplace, you have authorities you can report to. There's no one who is going to prefer the other one against you. Then you'll find out that the level of intimidation is extremely, extremely low in such societies. No wonder countries like Sweden, like Norway, like Finland, like Canada, like France, you understand, are doing so well compared to countries like ours, you understand, where even the man, look at COVID, when women were locked down, 
the rate of violence also increase. Understand? You will look for things to vent your anger on, and you go after the weaker ones. Understand? To vent your anger on them, period. So how then do we, you know, uh, proffer solution? I mean, I know that over time, like I mentioned in the opening, there's been several advocacy plans. You have civil society organizations, different groups just like yourself, uh, different persons advocating the cause of equality in our society. But that seemed, you know, not to be recording significant uh, progress. So... In Varaga is sliding because when you look at it, the Nigerian... Uh, index, you understand, global, world global index. In 2021, you understand, there was 139 out of 153. And recently, uh, 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 in 2006, 94 out of 153. So we are going down rather than going higher. So what are and we not doing go. right? So I think, well, I think government needs to expand, uh, 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 government needs to increase budgeting and make concerted efforts to create role models who are committed to hand-holding. Because when you have role models, mentors you are looking at, like we started a program we call Girls for Mining, because we had a, pro we had a, a, a research fund to, to look at mainstreaming gender into the mining sector. And in our course of capacity building, you find out that there are some things you can change. People who didn't go to school can just not comprehend what you are teaching because it's a technical area. So what did we do? We decided to reach out to young girls in secondary school and we picked about 10, 10 in 10 different schools in each state. That's 100 per state. And we decided to start focusing on those ones, create a, an app with which we created a community to be able to reach them. And I can tell you that when different groups, different associations start doing that, focusing, you see the Nigerian Society of Engineers are doing the same thing, that is Upwell. I was reading about it, Dr. Ebilola doing the same thing on, you know? So we all we just have to keep on doing is continue to mount pressure to make sure, you understand? And not that alone, in the cost of doing it, we must equally be systematic in what we are doing. Looking at the data, looking at strategic methods of intervention, strategic methods of intervention, because what applies in the North does not necessarily apply in the West. What applies in the West does not necessarily apply in the East. So we must look at local situations and find ways of ensuring we get to these children to be able to ensure they get educated. And then we must equally build up our advocacy strategy to National Assembly, you understand, to traditional leader, leaders, to uh, religious institutions, and let them know why it is very important, for instance, to make sure that the girl child is educated. In Ebony State, for instance, when we went to Ebony State, we engaged the community, the community leaders, ASAs, who don't allow women to normally sit with them in CDA, that is in drawing up agreements or getting consent. But today they change, you know, when we, 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 because we, the moment you neglect 50% of yourself, that is half of yourself, you cannot grow. You mentioned it in your narrative, you understand? The economics, uh, potential of such an area is eroded already because even if you have to get experts to work, you have to pay those experts compared to when you have your own local conditions where you can train up your own people and use rather than keep on bringing expatriates from China and everything to come and fill up your space. So when we do that, the well-being, there will be local, uh, the local economics will be developed, the national economic will develop, and then you will find out that everybody will be happy. It will be a, not this first happiness of every weekend, but it will be real happiness. You can see that at every little thing, people trip to the street to want to destroy, to want to do it. It's because every, there's tension everywhere. Yes, you can say the men, the, where you have the men and the women, you know, working at par and successful, the tension in the society, I tell you, will be drastically reduced. And the way to do it is advocacy, education, interventions, or different interventions at all hands, whether in churches, you know, everywhere we must just make sure we talk, we, we, we keep on talking on uh, girl edu education. Education for all in the actual sense of it. But because the girls are the ones really marginalized now, concentrate on the girls and make sure, you know, you give them what is due. I mean, you've pretty much covered uh, the, the, the main areas of this conversation. Um, uh, you know that uh, you've already said that they are, apart from the the constitutional angle, of course, the Nigerian constitution, it provides for gender equality, uh, it provides for non-discrimination, uh, but this still does not mean that discrimination against women is, 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 is taken care of, it still exists. You've talked about 
looking beyond just the constitutional amendment and going to the National Assembly to look at education and advocacy. But, um, you know, even when you look at education and advocacy, um, concerted effort by all concerned, men and women, um, the question of religion is, is, um, is, is, a, is a big one, you know, because when it comes to religion, it's, it's a, always a difficult, you know, um, it's a difficult it's pushback, even from women themselves. Uh, religion is a very powerful phenomenon, and we're deeply religious in Nigeria. Um, how can the challenge of uh, religious norms that go against uh, gender equality and bridging bring the gender gap, how can it be, be, be overcome, be addressed, and be tackled? I, I think the issue of role models, where hand-holding and role models come up. Because I have quite a number, of, especially in the North, I have quite a number of Northern friends who are Muslims, who are educated and well, very, very well educated. For instance, the first vice chancellor of uh, University of Abuja, we were all together in the University of Lovell in UK. And uh, she came home, she became a VC. That, that's, I'm talking of Laraba. Uh, Lara, Laraba. And uh, there are quite a number of other Northern women who have occupied positions. If these women, you understand, will be bold enough, you know, to champion advoc advocacy issues, I tell you, reach out. And you know, the religion is embedded, um, culture is embedded in religion. If you look at the way of dressing Christianity, it's because of the climatic environment where they are, you know, where they wear white and then the Jews. And look at the Muslims and the Christians in the, in the Middle East. Their dressing is similar because of the scorching heat and things like that. So religion itself is not static per se. It keeps evolving. If these women get committed into advocacy, and actually and dedicate their time and their lives, you understand, to say, we want to leave a legacy. We don't want to be selfish about it. I tell you, the women were not going to school before, but now none of women are going to school. They are even more in politics. You know, They are even having more political opportunities than those of us in the South, you understand? So for me, I believe that the only way out of this thing is to free their leaders, you free their uh, religious masters, you understand, of whatever shackles of ignorance, you know, they are tied into, you understand, and make sure, because the silver bullets to development, I tell you, is education. How give women education, even if you don't have that degree, make sure you have some semblance of education that can make you operate the computer, because we are now in a digital age where everything is digitalized, you understand? Where you can communicate with people, where you can do your business conveniently without relying on anybody. And until, and education is even about traveling. You go out, even the food you eat, everything is embedded in education. So that these ladies, you understand, just have to be committed. Government on its own cannot do anything because even government says free school. Yes, go to that free school, people will still not go. But if you're able to convince people, you understand, to let them see the input and let them see the advantage of what education can bring, I tell you, people will shift ground. And you can see them shifting ground already. You have spoken, you know, really uh, to these issues that we have to address it from our cultural and uh, traditional beliefs, you know, encourage. That's the only way we can, you know, get to the solution of all of this. Because at the end of the day, you probably have policies without implementation. Who implements these policies? The people. And how can you believe, uh, you know, do what you don't believe in? You know, that's a lot of, you know, challenge right there for the people. But thank you so much. We have to go now. Uh, Honorable Engineer Janet Adeyemi, uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Then uh, we have been speaking with the woman. I mean, she's the president and founder of Women in mining in Nigeria, right here in Lagos. Uh, she shared a thought on the issue of gender. But, you know, it's just me sitting here advocating the cause of men, thinking that <laughs> whenever we talk about gender equality, it feels like the men are left out, you know, from the table. I, I, I must commend you, Mercy. Uh, you did well. You did very well. <laughs> You know, because you ask the questions this dispassionately and, and you try to bring balance to this, you know, and uh, you allowed me to talk as well. Mm. Yes, well. but anyway, we, 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 we uh, look at what the CBN is doing maybe tomorrow. She she might. Uh, yeah, she uh, might. <laughs> you know, so, so, so there's something, I you mean, we're, we're coasting this conversation down now, but we can just have this little time. There's something I just saw some people saying that all along, could it be that the president had been behind you know, the uh, directions that we've been having from the CBI. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it feels, it feels like he's been giving it the It has been, has been codedly, let's use, uh, permit me to use the word, 
uh, uh, telling Nigerians that the president has been behind it. You look at his speech, the last one where he, told, he apologized to Nigerians and said they want to extend the deadline. And then when the deadline was extended, he said the president had approved. Go back to that first speech. You see he kept saying the president and all that. You know. So um, I think it's, it's now clear. You know, that, that's, that's what it seems like. All right, uh, please follow us on social media. Um, that's my speculation, by the way. Uh, uh, follow us on social media, Plus TV Africa, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We have a, a second YouTube account, Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. My name is Kofi Bartels. Uh, that's goodbye from this side. All right, and thank you for joining us. I am Messi Eboko. We join the newsroom at 9 o'clock for the news brief. Please stay with us. Good morning.